You may have found yourself staring at a food label wondering, what exactly is a fat or a carbohydrate? Why does everybody think that proteins are so healthy for you? Why are sugars indented under carbohydrates? Or why is cholesterol placed right next to fat? These very molecules, fat, cholesterol, carbohydrates, proteins, make up the organisms that we eat, but they are also part of our very own bodies. These molecules allow the muscles in our arms and legs to contract, or the adipose tissue in our stomachs to store fat for energy. And some molecules throughout our bodies code for the unique traits that make us us. To understand the relationship between the contents of our food and the contents of our body, we have to look very closely at the clusters of covalently bonded atoms that comprise us. By studying these molecules, we can better answer several essential questions. First off, we can figure out what organisms are made of, and thereby understand what they are exactly. We can also figure out how parts at one level of organization, such as atoms, interact to give the next level new properties, such as molecules. So depending on what atoms a molecule is made of, that molecule will be able to do different things, serve different purposes within our body. And lastly, we can look at how the structures of each of these molecules allows them to function in a particular way. The molecules we'll be studying in this video lecture are called macromolecules because they are big and complex. So that's where the macro comes from. And then the fact that they are molecules tells you that they're made of many clusters of atoms that are all covalently bonded together. How does the body make these large macromolecules? Well, it does so in smaller steps. The macromolecules can be quickly assembled in our bodies by joining smaller molecules together. The smaller molecules are called monomers, mono meaning one. Take a bunch of monomers and string them together and you have yourself a polymer. Poly means many. So a polymer is a long chain of repeating subunits or monomers. Our bodies are constantly synthesizing polymers, that is, making them, taking monomers and stringing them up. But then, when we eat food, our bodies are digesting those polymers, that is, they're taking the polymers, breaking them down into their monomers, so that then our bodies can take those monomers, synthesize them again into polymers that are uniquely us. It's kind of like if you were to eat a brick house. Your digestive system would break that brick house down into a pile of bricks. Your circulatory system would take those bricks and ship them around your bodies. And then the cells in your body would rearrange these bricks to make stylish new structures. The structures are distinctly you, even though the bricks came from that same old house. Another thing to know about macromolecules is that they are organic, or carbon-based. That is to say, they are structurally complex because the carbons can bond with up to four other atoms at once within them. If we look more closely at the monomers within a macromolecule, it will be easier to understand. Take this carbohydrate monomer as an example. This carbohydrate monomer is able to have such a complex hexagonal shape only to the carbons that run through the center of this molecule. So take this carbon here, a second carbon, a third, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth. Each of these carbons is able to bond with up to four other atoms at once. They form a carbon skeleton to which the rest of the molecule is covalently bonded. Same with this protein monomer. Two carbons centrally located, allowing the rest of the molecule to be more complex. Same too with this nucleic acid monomer. You might not see the carbons right away, but that's just because the chemist who made this diagram was lazy. If chemists had to draw in carbons on every single molecule that they made, they would be drawing carbons all day. So they will leave corners blank. However, each of these corners actually houses a carbon atom. And you can tell because each of these corners also has four bonds coming from it. So in all of these cases, the monomers can be structurally complex because of the carbon within them. And if the monomers are complex, just imagine how complex the polymers would be. The last thing to know about macromolecules is that they are divided into four categories based on the monomers they're made of. Take carbohydrates, for example. Carbohydrates are made of this small monomer. Take a bunch of them and string them together, and voila, there's your carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are a readily available source of energy or structural support in our bodies. If you synthesize a chain of these monomers, you'll make yourself a protein. Proteins have very complex shapes, and within them are these small monomers assembled one after the other, just like the carbohydrates. Proteins are useful in our bodies for many things, including speeding up chemical reactions, generating movement, and transporting materials. To make nucleic acids, some of the most famous biological molecules, you need to string this monomer together one after the other. And when you do, it makes the double helix. On the left side, you can see one monomer after another monomer after another monomer. And then running down along the other side, you can see those same monomers only oriented upside down. 
So take a string of monomers on one side and a string of monomers on the other, twist them up, and you've got yourself a DNA molecule. DNA, as you know, can be used to store and replicate the codes for our traits. Lastly, by combining other molecules that we'll examine later, you can make the last group of macromolecules, the lipids. These molecules are used to store energy, build membranes, and signal through those membranes. So let's go through each of the macromolecules in more detail. So let's begin with carbohydrates as an example. Sugars, starches, dietary fibers are all different kinds of carbohydrates. In order to understand them though, we must know what are the building blocks? What is the monomer? Monomers of carbohydrates are called monosaccharides. Here's a picture of one. And there are many different kinds of monosaccharides. There's glucose, the most famous, which is the one that's depicted right here. There's also fructose, galactose, ribose, deoxyribose, and many more. But we'll be focusing on glucose as it's the most common molecule that we will see throughout this year. Like any monosaccharide, glucose has a series of carbons that form a ring structure. As you know, chemists are lazy and sometimes they don't bother drawing in the carbons. As a matter of fact, sometimes they don't bother drawing in any of the atoms at all except for the one lonely oxygen. But don't be fooled. If you see any of these diagrams, all of them are talking about the same famous monosaccharide, glucose. Glucose and other monosaccharides are very energy rich. Their bonds store a lot of energy, and cells can break them down as a quick source of energy when the time comes. When our cells have monosaccharides to spare, they store them by linking them together. If you take one monosaccharide and add it to another monosaccharide, you form what's called a disaccharide. As you already know, mono means one, mono means one, but di means two. So take two monosaccharides and add them together and you've formed a disaccharide. There are even more disaccharides than there are monosaccharides. I will tell you a couple of the most well-known ones. Lactose is a disaccharide that's found in milk that those who are lactose intolerant have trouble breaking down. Lactose is made when a glucose monomer and a galactose monomer are added together. If instead I were to take a glucose monomer and a fructose monomer and add them together, I would form table sugar, scientifically known as sucrose. And if I were to take two glucose molecules and add them together, as you can see in the diagram above, I would make a disaccharide called maltose. Maltose is found in sugarcane sap, and it's also used when making malted barley for beer or when making malted milk balls. But your cells don't stop there. If they were to take a whole bunch of monosaccharides and add them together, they would make what's called a polysaccharide. Poly meaning many. Though you may have never heard the term polysaccharide before, examples of polysaccharides are probably familiar to you. In this diagram, there are three of the most well-known. The first, starch, is synthesized by plants as a means of storing extra glucose. You can see that this starch in particular is coming from the potato that this guy has plucked from the ground. So if you were to zoom in on a cell that was inside that potato, you'd find small little packets of starch where the potato had stored that starch. This is why potatoes taste so good to us. When we eat the potato, we're the ones that get this long, yummy string of starch instead of the plant. Once we've broken down a lot of starch from our own potato-filled meal, we store a lot of those extra glucose molecules in our own version of this molecule. This polysaccharide is called glycogen. And glycogen is very similar to starch, only it has multiple branches, as you can see. There's a branch going up to the top here, there's a branch coming down through the middle, a branch going to the side. But each of the monomers inside is our good old friend glucose, just like was found up here. So the moment a person eats a potato, the starch molecule might get broken down. But then inside the muscle tissue of our own arms and legs, those monomers will get stored together again as their own polysaccharide called glycogen. Now carbohydrates are not always used just to store energy. Sometimes they're used as structural support. If you look very closely at the leaf on this potato, you were to zoom very closely in on it, you would see long, skinny, crisscrossing fibrils of a molecule called cellulose. Cellulose is the most abundant carbohydrate on the planet. It is also made of glucose monomers, though those glucose monomers are in slightly different orientations. So here's one glucose molecule upside down, and then here's another one right side up, and then another one upside down, and another one right side up. This is a little different from what you saw in glycogen and starch. As such, the cellulose makes a long straight chain, and each of these straight chains can lie one next to the other to form the fibrils that run through the plant. This structure is very strong and hard to break down. And if you don't believe me, just go kick a tree. 
plants aren't the only organisms that contain structurally supportive carbohydrates. Insects do as well. Take, for example, the dragonfly that is eclosing from this exuvia right here. You can see its head down this end and its long abdomen extending this way. And on its back, you can see its wing buds that will eventually become wings that will grow out to the side like this. What many people don't know is that dragonflies as larvae actually live in the water. And this dragonfly larvae recently climbed up this plant until it got to the top. And the adult is now emerging out of the back of the larvae. And so the larvae is left behind right here clinging to the actual plant. But it's not an actual larvae, it's just the shell that's left behind. This shell, or exoskeleton, is made of its own polysaccharide, a polysaccharide called chitin. Chitin is also found in the cell walls of fungi, allowing mushrooms to stand straight up in the air. And some clever surgeon found that surgical thread would best be made out of this strong polysaccharide.